The steps to determining the formula for an ionic bond are, first you have to find um, the elements or that atom's charge. Okay, You have to locate where the charge is, and that's basically like where it is on the periodic table. And then you need to take the charge and swap in drop the charges. Um, we call that crisscross. You gotta crisscross your charge. I'll demonstrate this here in a minute, in just a sec. Um, there are two main types of ionic compounds. There's metal and nonmetal, which is our sodium chloride, um, iron two chloride, and then there's metal and polyatomics, like sodium um, nitrate or like lithium <clears throat> hydroxide um, and these are more molecular like they will also contain um, non-metal components and you have a list of these on the back of your periodic table I bet you were wondering what that list was well now it's time to use it that's your polyatomic ion sheet um, and you're gonna get familiar with that now we also call um, this part right here, where it's just between a metal and a nonmetal, we call that binary. And between the metal and the polyatomic ions, we call that tertiary. Um, see, in chemistry, you can't just learn one thing. You got to learn it three different ways. Okay, so let's write our first ionic formula um, and follow the steps. It wants to write a formula between sulfur and aluminum. So first you have to find the element on the periodic table. Aluminum's in column 13, so it's got a positive 3 charge. Um, sulfur is in column 16, so sulfur has a uh, negative 2 charge. Now we always write the cation first and then, that's positive, and then the anion, the negative guy, second, okay, and then we're going to swap and drop their charges, which become the subscript in the formula. So when I bond aluminum and sulfur together, it comes in a form of Al2S3. That means when aluminum and sulfur bond together ionically, it takes two aluminum and three sulfurs. So the charge on the one atom becomes the subscript of the other. All right, let's try this again. Between magnesium, magnesium, it's in column two on the periodic table, and fluorine, which is in column 17. So magnesium with a positive 2 charge and fluorine with a minus 1 charge. When they bond together, we swap and drop, making magnesium fluoride. So when magnesium and fluorine bond together, it takes one magnesium to bond with every two fluorine. And this definitely takes some practice. Let's try another. another. Calcium in column oh, two. 2 on the periodic table and oxygen has a negative 2 charge um, from the periodic table because it's in column 16. All right, so I'm going to write um, oops, over there. I'm going to write the charges because I like to write the charges above it first. That helps me determine that. All right, and now I'm going to sew up and drop making calcium to O2. Um, but the next rule is is that you have to simplify. Now you're only going to get like 2 and 2 or 2 and 4, something along those lines. So when you simplify this, you just get calcium oxide because each of those can be divided. So don't forget to simplify here at the end. Now remember what I talked about uh, in the beginning with the periodic table, those transition metals, like what's unique about them? And that is, is that <clears throat> they form many, um, many ions or they have uh, different charges uh, 
for the element. So iron can have a positive two charge and a positive three charge, okay? But for the most part, all of these transmission, uh, transmission, <laughs> transition metals are um, cations, okay? They're all gonna be positive. So how do you know um, the elements in metal? Like how do you know what their charge is? And we have a system um, and this may or may not look familiar to you. It's a system of Roman numerals. We notate <clears throat> their, um, their charge by a Roman numeral. So that's a Roman numeral one. There's two. There's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Oh, hold on, messed that one up. I was just getting all excited here for a minute. Okay, um, then let's see here. All right, nine and ten. Um, and quite frankly, we don't really go past six, seven. That would be tricky. Uh, for the most part, you'll see Roman numerals uh, two through two through four. Okay. Um, there are three exceptions to the Roman numeral rule. Well, as it turns out in recent years, there's probably a little bit more than three exceptions. Um, these transition metals, zinc, silver, cadmium, scandium, zircon, nickel, hafnium, they all have um, known charges. They only make one oxidation number, so they usually don't get a Roman numeral. Um, but there's there's definitely some controversy on this group right here. So on your polyatomic ion sheet, you probably just see this. Um, and you may just see these guys right here, cadmium and scandium, because they end up on um, your worksheets. Um, but don't forget that there are a couple of others. But for the most part, you're not going to be tested outside of zinc and silver. Zinc has a positive two charge, and silver always has a positive one charge. So oftentimes, they will not get a Roman numeral. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the skip column. That would be everybody in carbon's family, all right? Carbon, um, I'm sorry, column number 14, everybody in carbon's family. So how do you know if I am a four plus or am, if I'm a four minus? Um, and really, you've got to determine on who I'm bonded to. If I am looking at these two formulas right here, C3N4, B4C3, in this, call, in, in this formula right here, carbon is used as the cation. And in this formula right here, it is used as the anion. So you, that 4, which was right here, was once the charge on the carbon, right? So if I uncrisscross them, then you can see that nitrogen had the minus 3 charge, carbon had the 4 plus charge over here. And then over here, if I uncrisscross it, that was carbon's minus 4 charge and um, the negative 3 charge was there. So it kind of depends on, on where it was. And, you know, and quite honestly, that's why carbon is the basis of, of all life is because, you know, she'll just bond with anybody. She'll bond with whatever, you know, she wants to bond with. Positive things, negative things, big things, small things, just whatever. All right, back to this um, transition metal uh, thing here. So let's uh, bond between sulfur and iron two. So I know that my iron has a positive two charge because it's my cation and all the metals are cations. And I look up sulfur on the periodic table and it's in column 16, so it's got a minus two charge. So then I'm going to crisscross my charges, swap and drop, bring the charge, make it the subscript of the other element there, giving me a B2 S2, and then I simplify because I can divide both of those by two, giving me iron two sulfide. Let's try another lead and chlorine. So here's lead. Lead is my cation, that is lead, um, lead four, and chlorine is my anion. It's in column 17, so it's got a negative one charge. So I'm going to crisscross my charges, swap, drop, and say this is lead, PB, 
Cl4. And here we have lead floor, I'm sorry, yeah, lead four chloride. And um, finally, we have a bond formed between zinc and chlorine. So zinc is my cation and chlorine is my anion. It's column 17, it's got a negative one charge. And then zinc is one of my exceptions to the rules. So if I look back up here, zinc always has a positive two charge. So I'm going to say that this guy right here has a um, positive two charge. So I'm going to swap, drop, giving me ZnCl2, zinc chloride. I hope you see that this is looking a little complicated at this point. Um, no amount of video watching can prevent the benefits of practice. Like you really need to practice in order to get better at this chemical formula writing thing. It's definitely probably one of, if not the most challenging things that high school chemistry students learn.